Hi, and welcome to the Proof of Work podcast with my friend Devon and myself, Clearwell. In this episode, we're talking to Bennett Tomlin. Bennett's one of a small group of dedicated unsung heroes who spend enormous amounts of their time documenting and working tirelessly to spotlight the behaviour of Tether and their associated company Bitfinex, as well as critiquing the crypto space in general. We'll be discussing the story of how Tether, a stablecoin at the centre of the whole crypto space, is playing fast and loose with the facts about the state of their financial foundations and appears to be doing their utmost to avoid adhering to acceptable accounting transparency practices. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Bennett Tomlin. Hi, Bennett. Um, Thanks for agreeing to come on the uh, podcast. Uh, Maybe we could start with the obvious stuff. First, um, what's your background? What do you do for a day job if you have one? And how did you come, become interested in the digital assets and crypto space? Sure. My day job is as a data scientist working in the pharmacy space, designing and maintaining our fraud detection algorithms and systems to help us um, identify fraudulent pharmacy claims. I got interested in cryptocurrency towards the end of 2017 because I was coming close to graduating college and was reading a whole bunch of different stuff to figure out what I wanted to do after I graduated. I started during my research bumping up against this, at the time, strange and relatively small company called Tether, which seemed to have a history of strange behavior. I kept researching it. And, of course, discovered Bitfinex, who was one of the loudest and most dedicated people trying to expose Bitfinex and Tether and started reading their work. Early in 2018, because of the amount of harassment Bitfinex was receiving, they stopped writing as many articles, stopped discussing Tether and Bitfinex as often, And so, because I was still interested in it and thought the claims this company were making was untrue and thought the things they were doing were bad things, I started writing more often about Tether and about cryptocurrencies more broadly. But a lot of my work has been focused on Tether and Bitfinex. Okay, and um, are you generally for or against digital assets if you got a strong opinion one way or the other and if so why i think that there is value in cryptocurrencies specifically i think that the value for cryptocurrencies often comes from their censorship resistance and their resiliency so having the ability to either transact and send value that basically cannot be stopped is a uniquely valuable thing. And I think this extends to other chains that then allow you to do other things in that same manner. So Ethereum allows you to do a variety of censorship resistant computations effectively, these state transitions in these contracts. And so I think that has value. And I think the fact that these systems, more so than some others, are designed to be resilient, to handle a lot of strain and stress and unexpected circumstances also provides value. Generally, I'm considered a crypto skeptic because I also believe that much of the cryptocurrency ecosystem is valueless. Yeah, well, going back a little in our history, we both read The Creature from Jekyll Island about 15 years ago. So we've been aware of the problems of the traditional finance uh, world. So out of random accident, we both got interested in Bitcoin at the same time. And I think we both consider Bitcoin to be different. I always say on the chart, it should say Bitcoin gap, everything else. Because I think Hmm. Bitcoin is the one thing that's got that complete decentralized, well, proof of work, of course, and the decentralization, which sets it apart from a lot of these other projects, which I agree with you are possibly a little shaky. Is there a reason why you and the other band of brothers, I call you, um, really care so much about this? Is it, are you protecting an investment you've got? Do you think crypto challenges your, maybe your 401k or, you know, f- the fiat system is a threat to you personally? Or is it a hobby? Or are you concerned for other people? Or 
philanthropist. He... <laughs> yeah, so my investments are very boring. The entirety of like my investment portfolio, to call it that, is basically in um, target date retirement funds, so fund of funds containing basically all index funds. And I don't really touch those. Um, I generally think that like as a writer and as someone covering the space, the less exposure I have, the more easily I'm able to think and reason around the things happening in the space. And so because of that, I keep my investment portfolio extraordinarily boring. Um, so I don't think the reason I'm skeptical of a lot of this is because I see it as some threat. For me, it was just fascinating and interesting to read the Tether story. Like it's this dollar token on the blockchain started by a child star who's linked to a known pedophile in combination with all of these um, other people with these strange pasts, like Stuart Hogner, the lawyer for both Bitfinex and Tether, having previously been the director of compliance for a poker site that lets some players cheat. Um, or like Giancarlo's exploits with his mysterious warehouse fire right before his business shut down for his uh, Italian electronics company. And so most of it for me was just becoming interested in the story and finding it to be such a strange and compelling story that I felt like continuing to tell it. Can I just ask how your, from what you said earlier about your day job, um, that must influence the way that you research the subject. Not not particularly, because the methods I'm using for that are largely trying to take like a massive set of data, millions of different pharmacy claims and stuff, and identify a subset we want to look into more thoroughly. When researching something like Bitfinex and Tether, it's a very different kind of research. It's more just having the patience and wherewithal to go through like a whole bunch of court filings and documents and read all the details and keep track of that. So it's it's in many ways a very different skill than what I'm doing like on a day-to-day -day basis at my day job. And I think that's part of the reason I enjoy it. If it was just doing more of the same, more of setting up the big data pipelines, more of trying to process the transaction information and stuff like that, I think I'd probably find it a lot less engaging. I get my fill of that between nine and five. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, so have you got any insight into why you think people who, well, we consider should know better are so flippant about the dangers of Tether? Because Tether seems to be right smack at the core of a, so much of what's going on in crypto. Have you got some insight? Do you, do you, do you think there's a, re, are they, is it vested interest, do you think, or...? I think there's a few different things at play. So I think some of the largest Tether users are using it in such a way that their relative risk is pretty small. So if you are a major market maker like Cumberland Global and you're doing billions of dollars in trades and stuff like that, having exposure to a an amount of Tether that you need in order to perform those trades is, even if that were to go to zero, is probably not devastating for your core business, right? And if you're looking at more of like a proprietary trading firm like Alameda Research, still then they're going to expect that using Tether, participating in this ecosystem is going to give them opportunities to make, um, to make enough to wipe out any of the risk that comes from them having to interact with Tether to do that. And then specifically for a firm like Alameda that's made so much of its money doing arbitrage trades, in order to successfully do that, they're going to want to go to the most liquid unit of account, right? And so they're going in and out of Tether a lot because it is that most liquid unit of account in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Now, that explains some of the very knowledgeable people who are using it for very specific purposes. The other part of it is Tether has existed now for seven years and still continues to exist and trade at a dollar. And so for many people, that is evidence enough that Tether can't be doing anything that bad because Tether still exists. Then for another subset of Tether users being like uh, OTC desks and users in Asia, it is less important because it's still, even without backing, a reasonably good dollar facsimile. Um, 
And so I think it's a combination of either the risk to that individual being relatively small because of what they're doing, it serving its purpose well enough that the risks are not relevant, and then a probably the largest subset numerically is just people who are not aware or not interested in whatever risk it may pose. Mm. I assume that we need a stable coin for the whole crypto space. I mean, neither of us have got experience with traditional markets or market making. Is it essential that we have a stable coin? I mean, I have never used it personally. Yeah. Uh, so it's not necessary. Um, Tether sits a kind of an interesting place in the cryptocurrency history because when it first came onto the scene in late 2014 and really started to see a little bit of adoption into 2015, it was still very difficult for many cryptocurrency companies to get consistent banking, especially if they wanted to use the US dollar. Right. Um, Bitfinex and Tether themselves have struggled with this immensely over their history. And so... For many uh, white label and offshore exchanges, it was easier to make your base pair Tether and basically outsource that banking responsibility to Tether Limited rather than do it yourself. The other part that feeds it is having this stablecoin, this token that can move between exchanges, between desks and stuff like that easily, means it's a really good way to perform arbitrage, to try to take advantage of differences in prices because you can move the the funds from, say, Kraken directly to Bitfinex or Bitfinex directly to Coinbase or whatever. And so because of that, you are able to more quickly react to inefficiencies in the market, which is valuable for that type of trader. Right. But even with the brief description, Bennett, immediately it sounds like it's going to be very, very difficult to actually keep a track on where all those tethers are and thus stick to the idea that you're supposed to have one for each dollar that's in the system. Well, I mean, that part is relatively easy because there's only one company, Tether, who controls whenever Tethers are created or destroyed, right? And so where they go after that doesn't affect how many assets they have or how many there are in circulation. So as long as Tether only creates Tethers in response to getting the funds and then destroys them when they return the funds, then it is easy for Tether to ensure that they have sufficient assets for every Tether in circulation. The reality of the situation is, of course, and we especially saw this with the recent CFTC settlement, is that that was not how Tether was functioning. And they did not have the internal accounting systems to ensure that's what they were doing. But um, at first glance, at first face, it certainly appears like that part would have been easy for them to control. The part where they might have gotten into more trouble is dealing with um, regulators and law enforcement's general desire for banks and similar entities to know who all their customers are and like how the funds are being transacted. And in that case, Tether can't really do that because once the Tethers have been issued, they are on the blockchain. I should caveat that slightly because Tether does have a habit of freezing Tethers once they are out and about. And so there have been cases where presumably law enforcement or someone has approached Tether and said, this address here was involved in such and such crime. Do not allow them to use Tethers. And Tether will add that address to a blacklist in the smart contract. And then any Tethers they have get frozen and it's impossible for other people to send them Tethers. So surely a heading for catastrophe. I've heard some people saying that well, it could upset things. It might only cause like a 7% shrinkage or something like that. But there's so much of it floating around. It's surely holding up a lot of other assets. I certainly think so. So I think the 7% figure is probably coming from taking Tether's 70 billion or so market cap and dividing it into like the market cap of Bitcoin itself, which to me represents a very limited view of what liquidity shocks generally represent. Um, and generally a liquidity shock, like in this case, Tether breaking its peg, would you'd expect to have an outsized impact beyond just its market cap. Um, the other part of this is that Tether itself now represents like this hidden embedded leverage inside the cryptocurrency ecosystem. 
Um, we've seen this, especially with their more recent agreements with places like Celsius Lending, right? Where Celsius is putting up Bitcoin as collateral in order to get tethers, which is effectively amplifying the leverage in the cryptocurrency ecosystem as a whole and likely magnifying any negative effects of a tether collapse. So Celsius are using Bitcoin to get tether. Why do they need tether? You mean Celsius, the company or the customers? Celsius is the company, but Celsius is presumably passing those tethers on to their customers who are interested in getting loans of tether, which they then use to then go out and buy more cryptocurrencies. Right, so, right. so the cycle here is user deposits Bitcoin at Celsius. Celsius puts that Bitcoin up at Tether in order to get Tethers. Those Tethers are lent out to cryptocurrency traders who then use it to buy Bitcoin, which they could then hypothetically deposit at Celsius, which Celsius would then give to Tether. And you can see how that type of rehypothecation of the assets represents extra leverage in the system here. Yeah, because I was going to ask the question, I, I believe um, Tether don't redeem with customers like us is that right well i don't know much about you two individually but like the minimum redemption size is about 100k and the number of like approved tether customers is in like the dozens right um it is i, I don't know that it's hit triple digits um so that, yeah there's a very small subset of firms who are actually able to go to tether and give them tethers and receive presumably dollars in exchange I mean, the question is, have, did you, do you think Tether set out to be this dodgy? Because I, I sort of sometimes picture in my mind, it's something got ahead of itself and they just freewheeled it because they had to keep the, I don't know, the wheels turning or, or do you think they literally set out to be shady and it's a cut and run at some point? I mean, they seem so central. It's, it's somewhat unclear to me. So I like I've talked to some of the early Tether executives and in my conversations with them they seem to be believers in the mission of Tether and what it was trying to accomplish. They may have been even at that point negligent, perhaps even criminally so, but that does not necessarily mean they had bad intentions. They might just have been incompetent. And this is ex-employees, um, ex-founders, or people who are still in the company? Yeah, former. Former. Former, okay. yes. Okay. Um, the current ones are not my biggest fans. Uh, <laughs> and then um, the recent Bloomberg reporting by Zeke Fox, the Business Week article, discussed some new information that makes me think there might have been a point in or about 2017, 2018, where there was a really meaningful change in Tether and where we started to see a lot more of this bad behavior. Uh, John Betts, who was the then CEO of Noble Bank, where Tether was banking, described to Bloomberg that during their tenure at Noble, they always had the total backing of Tethers that was expected there at Noble. Mm. Betts is deliberately not saying that for a lot of that time, Tether did not have its own bank account and Bitfinex was holding Tether's backing, but they seem to have had at least most of the assets they were supposed to. Based on the CFTC uh, settlement, it would seem that they weren't keeping very good records, were probably often doing some smaller unsecured lending of Tethers and stuff like that, but largely seemed close to the book. Juan Carlo de Vecini, the CFO of Bitfinex and Tether, seems to have been interested in finding new ways to earn yield on Tether's reserves to make Tether a more profitable business. So this is when we see Phil Potter leave Tether and Bitfinex. The cover story for that was that Bitfinex and Tether were pivoting away from the US, and so his particular brand of skills was no longer needed. And at this time we see some kind of strange behavior. So Silvano Di Stefano, the chief investment officer of Tether, which is apparently a big secret. Tether's suing uh, to keep that a secret, but it's not actually a secret. It's been pretty widely reported. Uh, the, so Silvano Di Stefano, the chief investment officer of Tether, and Giancarlo Di Vecini together started a cryptocurrency investment fund called Bluebit Capital in 2018 out of Italy. At the same time, 
Paulo Arduino, the chief technical officer of both Bitfinex and Tether, became a director for Delchain, which was the cryptocurrency-focused offshoot of what was then Tether's new bank, Deltec Bank and Trust in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. Shortly after this, Delchain uh, announced that they had launched a new crypto-focused hedge fund, Fugger Alpha, and they were onboarding it to be a Bitfinex client. And so... There's a whole bunch of events right here in 2018 where we begin to see what looks to me like them building up the structure for them to make much more risky investments with their reserves. Then also in 2018, you've got the issues with Bitfinex and Tether's payment processor. So ever since Bitfinex and Tether had lost consistent U.S. correspondent banking with Wells Fargo in March of 2017, they'd increasingly relied on a shady Panamanian Colombian payments processor called Crypto Capital Corp. Crypto Capital Corp stopped responding to Bitfinex and Tether's requests for withdrawals uh, around June of 2018, shortly after or after Bitfinex and Tether had given them approximately $1 billion of commingled client and corporate funds without signing a contract. Uh, The reason Crypto Capital Corp stopped responding to these requests for withdrawals is that Crypto Capital Corp was tied up in an international money laundering and drug trafficking dragnet that had started to shut down a bunch of their bank accounts and eventually would result in So far, most of their principals being um, arrested. Uh, These would include uh, Az Yosef, who was arrested in Greece and extradited to Poland, uh, allegedly for money laundering for the Colombian cartels. Uh, This includes Reggie Fowler, the former owner of the Minnesota Vikings, who was arrested in, I want to say, Arizona and sent to New York for trial. Um, And then there's Ravid Yosef, who, who was also a part of it, was a fugitive and there's a rumor going around that she's now been picked up as well they were allegedly of course money laundering for the colombian cartels reggie was arrested with a bunch of equipment for counterfeiting um they had fake bond certificates and a bunch of other stuff and so by uh, the summer of 2018 they were no longer responding to bitfinex and tether's request for withdrawals In order to handle this, uh, Bitfinex started borrowing Tether's reserves in order to send them out to Bitfinex customers. This effectively made um, Tether fractionally reserved as Bitfinex was insolvent. Uh, This continued for several months until uh, November of 2018. They moved all the assets back into Tether's account on November 1st and had Deltec itself issue a letter being like Tether has the expected cash and cash equivalents. Uh, Their portfolio cash value exceeds the number of Tethers in circulations. Yay, Tether's fully backed. On November 2nd, Bitfinex takes $650 million out of Tether's account, immediately making Tether again unbacked, of course. And at the same time, Bitfinex issues a statement lying and saying that their withdrawals are working fine. They choose not to disclose any of these issues to the public at large and we don't find out about them until april of 2019 several months later when letitia james and the new york attorney general's office files against bitfinex and tether as part of that case and so to answer the original question was it always like this or was there some point where it changed i think it's likely they were always incompetent but As more information has come out, it seems increasingly likely to me that a combination of decisions and events made them much worse through 2017 and 2018. It sounds like it's just rife with corruption from day one, Um, and which doesn't bode well for for this uh, for such a a promising idea in general. To to have it based on such corruption already seems um, very disappointing and. Can I ask, Bennett, if, do, do, you, um, do you get worried in researching this? Because it's, it's a lot of money and people really don't like getting uh, their business poked into. Um, there have been times 
I've been worried. I understand why uh, many of the other people who like to write and talk about Tether and Bitfinex do it under pseudonyms. Um, that perhaps is the more intelligent choice when you're doing this kind of work. Uh, <laughs> I started under my real name because I was just interested in crypto more broadly. And I came across this. I'm like, huh, this is weird. I'm going to start tweeting about how weird this is. And now we're here. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, there have been times I've been worried. I mean, when we're when we're going through the crypto capital stuff and you're reading about the connections to the Colombian cartels, or when you're looking through Juan Carlo Davisini's connections and you see like the uh, second level connections to the Italian mafia, or when you hear about the triads using Tether and stuff a whole bunch. Oh. There have been times I've gotten worried, but it is, it's relatively uncommon for people to get killed for writing about things. So I just hope that remains true. <laughs> So a question then, do you, uh, there's peop some people want to claim that Tether has the ability to manipulate the Bitcoin price. Any credence in that? So I don't generally discuss manipulation much because I think right now the evidence is insufficient, which is not to say that there's no evidence or that it's conclusive. I just think it has not been conclusively proven. Um, one of the most common papers you'll see reference to support that is the Griffin and Shams is Bitcoin Untethered paper from 2018 that looked at the end of month returns and the flows of Tether to try to see if there was a relationship. I've discussed some of my criticisms about that paper publicly. Um, and if you look through their analysis, you can see that if you remove the two most anomalous months from their data set, you see the relationship between tether flows and uh, price action disappear. And so I think in any case where you take out the two most extreme values and you see the relationship disappear, if the relationship exists, it's probably relatively small at best. Um, a lot of the other papers suffer from potentially similar conceptual issues. However, uh, it seems to me that there's likely some amount of distortion inherent in the way Tether has done business. Frequently, this asset that people assumed were, was fully backed by dollars was not. So it was being treated on the market as if receiving a Tether was the same as receiving a dollar. And in a meaningful sense, it was not. Um, what effect that had on the price, I don't feel confident enough to make really any kind of statement. Now, more than ever, with some of the additional rehypothecation and the additional leverage embedded in like the lending agreements and stuff, I perhaps worry a little bit more about Tether's ability to manipulate the price. Like with the knowledge that they are willing to do unsecured lending and crypto secured lending, it seems possible that they would be able to extend sufficient liquidity to certain major market players so that they would be able to take advantage of certain things in the market and potentially manipulate prices. Um, but again, I don't think we have evidence that that is what Tether's doing. And so we've kind of got this thing where there's the structures in place, including some of the stuff like Bluebit Capital that the CFO of Tether and Bitfinex is a part of that could be used to either manipulate the market or to profit from knowing about certain market manipulation. But I do not think at this point that we've got sufficient evidence that that is what's happening. With all of that in mind, the fact that the, there seems to be a lot of commercial paper tied up in supporting most of the stable coins from what I can see is there actually that much difference between Tether and the rest of them? Or is that what you're going to go and look at next? Is there anything that, that, that that's on your kind of radar at the moment that you're thinking, wow, you think Tether's bad, wait till you see X? I have not found anything worse than Tether yet. <laughs> um, yet. <laughs> the, the other stable coins are certainly not flawless. Uh, USDC for a while was still advertising that their backing was all cash, even after they'd moved it away from cash. Um, 
But, like, uh, in the last couple of attestations, we've seen, like, the composition of circles, USDCs, reserves, change immensely. And now they're basically all in cash and very short-term commercial paper, which is generally much less risky than the more longer-dated uh, commercial paper. Paxos is, I believe, pretty much entirely in cash and U.S. treasuries, which is going to be pretty secure. Um, Gemini, GUSD, which no one uses, is, I think, entirely in cash. Uh, True USD, there was some oddities around their acquisition by some unknown company called Tecterix out of Asia, um, and their accounting firm for a while stopped providing them attestations. Uh, but I believe they've resumed, though I haven't looked at the composition of their reserves in a long time. Uh, I think Tether has had a history of uniquely bad decisions, poor choices, and like things like that that have contributed to its unique place. And I do think their reserves are uniquely more risky than others. Um, at least based on the attestations we've seen, we're not seeing other stable coins backed by digital assets. We haven't seen any other of these um, stable coins backed by secured lending agreements, which are collateralized by crypto. And so I think there is some uniqueness to the way Tether is structured as opposed to other stable coins. Can I go back a step? Because I'm, I'm a dummy like this. Uh, so if I take my dollars and mm -hmm. send them to Binance, say, and buy Tethers, the cash starts in Binance's account, presumably. Do they then buy Tethers with the cash, or are, they, are you saying they do other arrangements with Tether? Because you said they're interested in getting their hands on Bitcoin itself. So at that point, does Binance, for instance, have to make an agreement with yeah. um, Tether or some kind of loan? Is it a loan, or is it a straight-out purchase of Tethers? I haven't used... Binance specifically. I don't know about any arrangements they might uniquely have. That's just an example of course, Binance. Like, it could be any exchange. Yeah. I imagine that if you're buying tethers on Binance, you're not buying tethers from Binance. So either you are... So you're probably purchasing it from a market maker like Cumberland Global or Alameda Research who are effectively taking the other side of that trade and they're getting your dollars, and you're getting their tethers. Um, they, um, I don't know what their agreements with Tether look like. So they're probably taking those dollars, and they, they must have already had the tethers. It is unclear to me whether or not that was part of some lending agreement where they got the tethers basically fronted from Tether on the stipulation that they would... We'll have a big pile and we'll just try and exchange yeah. as we go. Yeah, Is that what you're thinking? We'll, we'll send the cash back. We'll cover it in a few days after we liquidate these two interested parties um, across the market. I, I don't know what those look like. Um, but I don't think Binance is often taking the other side of that trade. Oh, right. So they've got basically th a third-party supplier handling their transactions for those types of assets. Yeah, I mean, that's typical for like a lot of types of exchanges in general, too. The exchange is very rarely market-making on their own. Uh, Even if you look at like the New York Stock Exchange, right? Generally, they're going to partner with market makers who are providing the liquidity in those stocks. And... Often in those, you'll see kind of a similar dynamic where the liquidity begets liquidity and the network effects tend to lead to some of these firms getting really huge. Like I think Citadel, which is a company in the United States, executes like 70% or something of the total retail options flow just because they are positioned well in terms of their infrastructure and position the market to do that. And so the exchanges... There's often a misconception about Tether that the exchanges are the ones holding all the Tethers or that the exchanges themselves have a whole bunch of Tether. More often than not, I think they are just providing the software, the platform itself, and then partnering up with various market-making firms who are providing the liquidity to the markets that then the retail traders or the other traders come in and, and trade on using the platform. The exchanges will have some amount of Tethers because they're going to collect them in trading fees and stuff like that, but I don't think they're the primary ones one's providing that liquidity. Okay, I was just going to ask if if you um, if you felt that Tether needs to collapse and do the damage that will no doubt ensue um, in order for for crypto to actually make it to the mainstream 
in one piece, if you see what I mean. So it can kind of get have its death and rebirth again, um, or whether you think it will just slightly change as it goes along. I mean, some people are commenting on this stuff, and a lot of them seem to be saying, oh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's bad, but it will be okay. And that's definitely something that Clearwell and I have not felt at all. My impression is that that is poor advice. It is uncommon that you'll have, like, the Treasury Secretary, the head of the SEC, and the uh, head of the OCC all, like, specifically mention you by name as, like, a potential financial risk with all these problems. Um, I think that, especially, uh, like, under the... The President's Working Group on Stablecoins in the United States recently released their guidance that basically seems to suggest that U.S. regulators want stablecoins to become uh, chartered banks in the United States. I think it is extraordinarily unlikely that Tether would be able to restructure themselves in that way to meet that standard. And... I have half a feeling that even Tether themselves recognize this, and that's why you've seen like Juan Carlo and stuff so often recently emphasize Tether Gold and these other products like this, because they anticipate they may soon not be able to or have much more difficulty offering their general Tether USD product. The what now? Tether Gold? Yes, there's a Tether Gold. That's a new one. What's next? Uh, Tether Gold is supposedly... Uh, tokens issued by Tether backed up by gold. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Unicorns and berries and oh, my. Um, I mean, what is to stop Tether from just printing as many as they like? I mean, is there any break on what they do? Because effectively, they've got people eating out of their hands in a way. They go, OK, have it doesn't it, it defies logic. I guess that's why you're here, right? Why we're here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I haven't looked into Tether Gold in a while because it's not super broadly used. I think they had some way they claimed you could verify that there were gold bars somewhere. Oh. Um, you could ask Biff for next. Yeah, exactly. Tether actually offers several products. They've got Tether Gold, uh, the Euro Tether which they've been hyping up again. And for a while, they actually had a uh, offshore yuan tether that was run by Zhao Dong, the former king of OTC in China, who's now in a Chinese prison for money laundering. Wow. Um, yeah, and so they, uh, they have been emphasizing and advertising tether gold much more in the last couple weeks. And so it's possible that they are doing that in anticipation of it becoming much harder for them to offer their tether dollars. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that. That's um. um so I mean, I guess if, if they were going to print a load of tether, they could play all sorts of games with that, couldn't they? They could get out there and buy assets. They have. Do you, is there any? Are you aware of any mechanism they've got for that? I mean. Well, I mean, like we discussed previously, uh, the chief investment officer and the chief financial officer of Tether are both partners in Bluebit Capital, a cryptocurrency investment fund, right? Okay. Um, right, so that would be the entity they could use to... Gian, right. Yeah, Gian Luis Vanderveld is also the executive director of a venture capital firm out of Hong Kong. And that's the CEO of Bitfinex and Tether. Uh, Paulo Arduino, as I mentioned, was the director for Delchain, the cryptocurrency investment-focused offshoot of Dell Tech Bank and Trust. I think if that is what they wanted to do, they certainly have access to the infrastructure to do it. I find it very strange that these characters keep popping up regardless of how many times they've screwed people over. Well, I think I think it's probably a minority of people who feel that they've been screwed over by tether for example um like because as we mentioned for most of its seven year history it's traded pretty much at par and you've been able to get an exchange tethers in the market if not at tether for about a dollar and so for a lot of people it served kind of the function it was supposed to serve as this stable unit of account for the crypto uh ecosystem and so I think that there's a lot of people who perhaps are aware that Tether and Bitfinex have done some unsavory things, 
but have not been personally harmed by those things, and continuing to use them offers them opportunities to make money, and so they're going to continue to use them. Well, I guess we have seen quite a few um, changes of attitude, I would say, where people have started to, rather than ignore Tether, they've started to say, oh, yeah, well, don't use that. Stay away from that one. And I've, I've heard that coming up a lot more over the last three months before people were seemingly not bothered. They didn't think anyone cared. It was just like talking about dollars, whereas now they're actually um, advising people to steer clear from it. There was a period in 2018 uh, where we actually saw the largest number of like, as a portion of the market cap, at least the largest number of tethers redeemed and stuff like that, where there was a subset of cryptocurrency traders and stuff who would recommend that people stay away from Tether. So that has happened before, like in the past. Um, I mean, part of the dynamics here is that because crypto has been growing so fast over the last 12 years or whatever, often the majority of market participants, numerically at least, will be people who have joined within the last year, within the last 18 months, and so may not have been there or really know a lot of the history about these companies and so they largely form their opinions based on the general attitudes they see around them in the cryptocurrency community and i still think that there is a pretty large contingent in the cryptocurrency community of tether defenders or at least uh would see themselves as tether pragmatists who are not particularly worried about the risks of tether well i've actually written to some of them after reading your work to say, um, hello, look at this, please. Why aren't you addressing this? And they've completely blanked me, funnily enough. <laughs> they don't want to know. It upsets the apple cart. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, part of the dynamic, and I've had this expressed to me in basically as many words, is that some of them are aware that Tether has done some unsavory things, but they still believe that Tether is useful and good intentioned enough that they don't want to draw like regulator or law enforcement or attention more broadly to these problems because they worry that that attention itself will be the cause of the tether collapse and so there's an incentive among many in the cryptocurrency community to avoid discussing some of these problems too much in depth because that will sort the problem out yeah. No, I, well, that's a perfect segue. What, have you got a sense of what a collapse would look like or what, how it would proceed? What, what, what would be the possible straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak? Is the price of the whole market going up going to be an issue, do you think? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I th I'm skeptical of any collapse that would be caused by natural market forces. I think if we were going to see that, we likely would have seen it by now, and probably during 2018 when they were having so many issues surrounding um, banking and deposits and withdrawals. I think at this point, if there is a tether collapse, it would likely be caused by regulator or law enforcement intervention. Right. Um, I'm not 100% sure what that would look like because it probably depends on what tack the regulators or law enforcement take sure. if they roll in like it's liberty reserve and seize the domain and all the assets and send everyone away to prison <laughs> i think that that that's like the most extreme version right um the dynamics of that in the market are a little bit harder for me to predict and part of that is because of when I first started looking at this in late 2017, there was a lot less uh, futures and highly leveraged trading. There was BitMEX, of course, but um, outside of that, there were a lot fewer avenues for it. Now the market relies much more on like the futures and the leverage, and that's a much larger portion of the total trading. The other dynamic that makes it tricky is that the exchanges can, if they choose, decide to freeze trading. Um, or a subset of exchanges might decide to freeze trading. My general intuition about it, though, is that on what I think of as the Tether exchanges, where the primary base unit is Tether, we'd see the Tether-denominated price of Bitcoin explode. So a Bitcoin might be worth a million Tethers, right? I expect that, meanwhile, as liquidity across the marketplace starts to dry up, 
And with this kind of confidence shaking event on any fiat avenues that stayed open for trading, I expect we'd see a lot of people exchanging Bitcoin or other crypto assets for dollars as quick as they could. And so we'd see a really large premium open up between the price of Bitcoin denominated in tethers and the price of Bitcoin denominated in dollars. And so, yeah, so that's what I expect would happen. And is that likely to happen? How, how fast have you got a sense how fast that might happen or could happen? I, I mean, no, <laughs> uh, flash crashes can be pretty quick though. Like a matter of a few seconds, right? Cause I mean the 67% or so of tethers are issued to two firms, Alameda research and Cumberland global. Both of these are massive liquidity providers to the market as a whole. If either of them senses a potentially catastrophic problem with Tether and decides to pull their liquidity across the entire market, that is basically an immediate and massive event across all the markets. Um, I don't know exactly how fast or how extreme it would be, but I can't imagine it would be good for the crypto market, at least not in the couple of days term, maybe in the few years term. Because mm -hmm. actually one of the things that led me to discovering you uh, was, um, was Dan Held's comment, which you probably remember, that if Tether ever went to zero, everybody would exchange them for Bitcoin, which I just thought, I liked Dan Held before that. I think I still like Dan Held, but that's the kind of dumb comment yeah. that brings a bad rep upon you. I am curious about what Bitcoiners that Dan imagines would be exchanging their Bitcoins for these effectively worthless tethers. Um, because in order for there to be a trade, there needs to be someone on both sides of the trade. That's how a trade works. Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm a little curious how Dan imagines that playing out. I think he must have just tossed that comment out, not thinking it through, and uh, and if, and someone called him out on it. I think it's probably different if you're absolutely dedicated to Bitcoin and you've already got to the point where you're seeing things in terms of sats and you're just waiting for the rest of the world to catch up. If that's how you believe it's going to pan out, then it probably does feel different. You're probably less worried because in the your your version of events is the end game is having as much Bitcoin, so who cares? What what good are any dollars or anything else anyway? Um, so I can see why some of the Bitcoiners just think that, that everything else is irrelevant and that almost it's your fault for dabbling around in these things. You know, there, there seems to be a bit of that from some of the maximalists, but I just can't see how it's not gonna affect every single one of us. I certainly expect that it would affect the price to some extent. And I imagine that there is a subset of basically price insensitive Bitcoiners who don't much care what the dollar denominated price of their Bitcoin holdings are. I am curious what proportion of Bitcoiners that is. One of the, the things that really appeals to me personally about Bitcoin is the, is the trustless idea. And to have the two opposites working so closely together, on the one hand, you've got Tether, which you, I mean, from everything we've discussed so far, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't you wouldn't trust it ever. It's, you'd have to be a moron to think, yeah, oh, I, I think that, yeah, they've made a few mistakes, but I think they've got my, you know, my, they've got the best intentions for me in the long run. Of course they haven't. They, 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 they're, they're absolutely corrupt. Mm -hmm. And yet you've got Bitcoin, which is, supposedly non-corruptible and it's seemingly the best option. Personally, I feel that it is. Very interested to see what you feel is the best store of value, I suppose, Bennett, going forward. I don't have any particularly strong opinion. Um, my general investing philosophy is that productive assets are often the best ones to own, and I've got no really strong opinions on uh, money itself as a store of value. Uh, that's not something I particularly worry about. Yeah, it's not something I particularly worry about. So I, I don't have um, 
very many thoughts on store value? Well, it's never something that I was... Um, my whole life been a musician, so, I, it, you know, money is... <laughs> Yeah, good luck. Um, but to actually get to an age now where I'm going, realistically, what I do have, I'd quite like to still have in 10 years' time. And the idea that it could be worth a lot less is very disheartening to anyone in my position. Um, and and the hope, I think, that has been offered by the crypto world is is largely due to the fact that suddenly it becomes worth saving. And the damage that Tether could do to that seems, well, it seems actually quite frightening to me. It could really derail the future of a lot of people who do have good intentions. Yeah, and this is kind of why I made the comment about, I wonder how many price insensitive Bitcoiners there really are. Because like in 2018, when Bitfinex and Tether were having their issues with Crypto Capital Core, uh, you have like uh, Juan Carlo Davisini, the CFO, desperately messaging Oz Yosef over at Crypto Capital Core. And at one point he even says like, if, if we don't get this money, if we can't service these withdrawals, Bitcoin might uh, crash to 1K. And so I'm curious, like in a crash like that, if we were to see like that big of a crash in the value of Bitcoin, how many truly price insensitive Bitcoiners there are and how many are there who were, could perhaps weather a 50% drop, but not necessarily a 90% drop. I mean, we're not price insensitive. I mean, we can, like um, Dev was saying, we came, I, you know, we're both in a very similar situation. We came in because we saw an investment opportunity having, being blind to generally investing in general all our lives, working lives, so we're we're not certainly not insensitive to it. We're 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 happy to see the price go up, but like Devin says, we're we're worried about the ice cube melting. Um, I mean, I was going to ask you about the does the money printing not bother you? Do you see that as a as a you in the you're in the U.S. So of course. I don't know how much you get bombarded with the news about the printing and the charts going like this. And we get a lot of it here, surprisingly. Um, yeah. And there's a couple different things. I, I'm i not an economist, um, but I'm not particularly worried about inflation running it. I think it's just over a little over 3% right now. That doesn't represent a meaningful threat to me and doesn't seem ahistoric in the broader historical context of like the US dollar. Um, the US is perhaps in a somewhat unique position due to the uh, exogenous foreign demand for the dollar as its effective global reserve currency status allows it to potentially increase the supply with less of an effect. Um, the other issue is some of the graphs you're discussing, like you often see the M2 graph from Fred shown off to show the increase in money printing. And rarely will you see that included next to that graph, a discussion of how the measurement methodology changed right at the point where you see the huge spike, where like a asset class, I want to say it was savings accounts were now included in the number that were never included before. So that represents a lot of the change here. Moreover, just looking at the market more broadly, I could like right now get a mortgage for 3% interest over 30 years, which means the market more broadly doesn't expect inflation to continue for an extended period of time, because if it did, people would be taking out more and more dollar denominated debts in the expectation that those debts would be much easier to repay in the future because of the loss in value of the dollar. Um, and so I don't particularly worry about the money printing memes you'll generally see on crypto Twitter or anything like that. The money printing memes, I, I, I'm not, I don't see that many. I don't tend to look at Twitter to, that much, to be honest. Um, but the general idea worries me enormously. The fact that no, no fiat currency has ever lasted and it always seems to get to this point as it's on its way out, where it just starts to print more and more and more. I, I thought that was a real reason for concern. Um, we've just had a, we've just had an all time high here, Bennett, of uh, for the price of diesel for our cars, uh, where it's gone up now to one pound forty eight per liter. Um, and I did some a few uh, excuse my crummy maths, but I did um, turn it into dollars so I, so I could discuss it with you later. Um, 
it, it worked out about eight dollars. Like, Seven fifty a gallon. gallon. Yeah. Now, I, obviously, the fuel prices have, all, have always been different in our countries, but one pound forty-eight a liter is a lot here. And yeah, they, 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 there is no no inflation, but the price well, yeah, but I mean, of everything else is is going up noticeably to most people. So there seems to be this narrative of, no, no, everything's fine. Don't just don't let them see that, and that that that, that bothers me. Well, I mean, the UK is also a unique case because of their mm. recent entire restructuring of all of their global trade agreements. Yeah, of course. Um, but we're not alone. If it was just the UK, I'd go, yeah, fair enough. But it seems to be across Europe, there's there's a lot of people worried about the state of things and how much they're costing. And I, I think this is a lot of the reason that people are running to crypto. Because they think, uh, I can I get some money and either either Bitcoin's going to be offered as a solution, especially if you if you listen to someone like Michael Saylor, for example. Be interested to know what your what your views are on Michael Saylor. I, uh, if you have any. I think Michael Saylor is a securities fraudster, um, which is also the opinion of the Securities and Exchanges Commission, of course, after his uh, settlement in the early aughts. And I think he has a... I think the idea of trying to convert your business analytics company into effectively a leveraged closed uh, close ended fund as a bet on a hundred volatility asset is a very strange decision to make as the chief executive officer of a business intelligence firm. So you think he's being shady? Is he being shady? Is that what your that was one of my questions actually, and I thought I'll skip it because it's a bit Bitcoin related, but. Yeah, he's got a history of shadiness, and I think that I think that MicroStrategy benefited immensely from Sailor's decision to enter into Bitcoin. No doubt. But MicroStrategy itself is not supposed to be an investment fund, right? Like nominally, the business of MicroStrategy is to offer their software, and I don't necessarily think that they are well-structured or set up to be running as basically this levered investment fund. Yeah, see, that's a very different view again that then get that often gets presented. Um, there's a lot of people who, are, uh, there's a lot of hero worship going on with, with Michael Saylor for, for what seems like obvious reasons if, you, if, you, um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're into Bitcoin. But one of the driving forces for Clearwell and I to do this at all is so that we can learn and try and get the information that is um, not just the same information that's that everybody's throwing at you all the time. Um, I said I didn't know that in any of that about Michael Saylor. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely news for me. I don't know about you, Clearwell. Well. well, you made an interesting comment when we were talking earlier today, and you said if you want to believe that the crypto space is a is a savior of of people like us who are historically save you know like to save money then we're early, but you said, pending our conversation with Bennett, we're not too early to change our minds about the whole situation. Yeah, this is one of the things, I mean, we, if we do get the right information and we decide, oh, this is, a, this is a bad idea, I wonder if we would then feel compelled, like you obviously are, Bennett, to then start to use the podcast as a way to say to people, look, this is what we found. And I think that's, that's the thing you can't see about undertaking a venture like this. It kind of leads where it leads. Uh, am I right in thinking that that's kind of how you've ended up where you've... I mean, yeah. Uh, my podcast, we originally started just with a plan to do two episodes directly on Tether because both Cass and I had been writing about it for years and people had told us that they prefer to listen instead of read. And so we figured that uh, the two of us would sit down and record those two episodes um, after that, people had a bunch of questions, so we did a third question and answer episode, and then people kept asking for follow-up episodes, so eventually we rebranded and have been going since then, but our intention was certain, like, it certainly did not play out the way we originally expected it to, and we are both, both Cass and I are natively writers before we're podcasters. Right. Well, I was listening to the interview you did with Robert Green, mm -hmm. and he's certainly quite passionate about the state of things. Uh, and in fact, I was I was talking to Clearwell about this earlier as well. 
I found myself thinking, I don't know, I don't want to believe him, <laughs> but part of me doesn't, I'm helpless really, because I do agree with him that there is, uh, there are some seriously powerful people who will play this to their advantage all the time. I mean, that's just human nature. It doesn't matter which market you apply it to. That's always been the case. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting how he was saying about factoring in the costs of effectively removing the Pentagon and uh, the, the Federal Reserve, uh, factoring the cost into this utopian mm -hmm. future. But then I also play that against... Plan B's, uh, you're familiar with Plan B, I, I presume? Uh, yeah, they're the one with their magic model, right? They do the stock to flow, which is uh, that gets a lot of um, a lot of people talk about it or often. But his view of the same kind of subject is that it's going to be one hell of a fight, but he sees it as inevitably ending up in in the world where Bitcoin is Victor. Um, and the, the, it's good to see there are such different conversations actually taking place about it but it makes it it's very difficult to do when you come into it as newcomer it, despite whatever education level there's so much information that to try and ascertain the best way to look at this is it's it's insane so i re really appreciate your your um your insights and, and giving us the time to um to explain all of these things to us of course. um there's so much, so many questions. We could ask you great questions for hours, but I, I think we've uh, we've probably taken up a, um, a great deal of your time already. I've got one final question. Then I think it might wrap it up nicely. Um, what what would it take for you to decide that you would put some money into Bitcoin? Have you ever owned any Bitcoin? Oh yeah, um, I've owned both Bitcoin and Ether. Um, you were on the Silk Road, weren't you? No, I, I didn't use Silk Road. I yeah, no, I was after that. I I first read the white paper in 2014, but I didn't really get interested in crypto until 2017. I didn't buy until 2018, so I was way post Silk Road. Um, so I've owned both of them. I've used Bitcoin. I've issued assets on Omni. Um, I don't own it right now because I'm. Because I'm actively covering it, and I think that could make it more difficult for me to be unbiased. Uh, I don't necessarily know that there's any one trigger that would make me buy back into it. Um, if crypto enthusiasts and Bitcoiners are right and hyper-Bitcoinization occurs, I'll have no choice but to buy back in. Okay, well look, thanks very much for your time, mate. Sorry for the late start. Uh, that's all right. It's now, uh, yeah, it's getting on. I was just going to say, would you care to um, let the listeners or viewers know the best place to find you? Sure. I tweet an exorbitant amount at Bennett Tomlin on Twitter. I write at BennettFTomlin.com. And I am a co-host with Cass Pianci of the Crypto Critics Corner podcast, which you can find in all the places podcasts are. We'll put the information in the video link. All right, brilliant. Well, we'll sign off for now. Thanks ever so much there, Bennett, for your time. Really appreciate it. Great information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Bennett. Keep up the good work. Have a good night, y'all.